Welcome back, Cracked fans, to another edition of the Cracked Interviews Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Gruskin. What a fun time it is right now in the tennis world. First Grand Slam officially in the books. Novak Djokovic, Sofia Kennan emerging as our singles champion. That was the big storyline over these past two weeks, the first slam of the year, watching it transpire, who won, who came up short. The, that's obviously captured the attention of so many of the tennis fans out there. But there are other things going on in the tennis world. There are challenger results. There are college results. There are maybe even the bigger storylines from the Australian Open that you may have missed getting caught up in the day-to-day action. So that's what we're going to be talking about today here on the Cracked Interviews podcast, some of those bigger narratives emerging from our first Grand Slam of the 2020 season. And joining us to do just that, uh, you may know him for his coverage at Functional Tennis. He has recently started the Functional Tennis podcast, and we are thrilled to be joined today by Fabio Malay. Fabio, welcome uh, to the Cracked Interviews podcast. It's good to have you. Alex, uh, thanks for having me. Excited to be on here. I've heard uh, a lot about the Cracked interviews. I've heard not all the episodes, some of them. And I was recommended by one of my college tennis friends from Ireland who played in San Diego State. Uh, Kieran would I'd see him in the change room. He goes, man, have you checked these guys out? They're doing a great job. And that's how I came across you guys first. Now, the problem is we're on video doing this interview. Our podcast listeners won't get to see it, but you'll get to see me blushing. That's too kind of you, Fabio. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. And, you know, the feeling is mutual. It's, hard, you know, in, in this modern day of tennis coverage, it's not just, you know, articles and it's not just podcast episodes, interviews you do. Things like having a social media presence, such as your presence on Instagram, obviously a big way, a, a way tennis uh, fans follow the sport nowadays is the interactions they get on social media so the feeling is mutual it is a pleasure to be joined by you I believe uh you know your accent gives it away but I also was looking in the whatsapp when I was texting you that area code I believe that is an Irish accent so the first question I want to ask you following the Australian Open from where you are time zone wise was that as big a much uh, a big of pain of the to you as it was for me here no, not really. I think I could get up quite early with a new baby, so we're up quite early, about <laughs> 5 a.m. And we get the end of the day session, and then about 8.30 a.m., the night session started. So I work a lot on the laptop. You can have it on in the side, so it goes pretty smoothly. Back a long time ago, and I used to work later at nights. So I used to get the early sessions, but coming in late in the day and getting the night session is amazing. So, no, it works quite well. What was it like for you guys well I, I i've made this joke a couple of times but i would make sure to chug as much water as possible right before i go to bed so east coast i think it's like 16 hour difference or whatever so i get up you know smack <laughs> i get to watch some tennis as i'm going to sleep but i'm getting up 3 34 a.m going to take my nighttime pee i come back to my you know my bed i'm like you know what i'm gonna pop on some australian open i'll fall asleep watching you know a quick 15 minutes just try and sneak in some viewing whenever i can uh, not good for my sleep schedule, but certainly helped me follow along the tournament. I am thankful that, as you know, as great as that tournament was, that we are getting out of that time zone because that, the Asian swing, those are obviously the trickiest for us uh, in the States. Yeah, no, it, look, I, I can make it work anyway here. And it, it's probably bad in a way. At least you can still get your work done. It's, I know I say I'll watch it and do some work, but I'm definitely not productive. And I did find myself, I always, I'm always a slow, at the start, I was just, you know, you watch a little and then as it goes on more and more and depend who's on, what stage in the match. And then there's other people around, they get into it as well. So it's, it's exciting. And Amazon have done a great job to, oh, sorry, it was Eurosport. Sorry, excuse me. Eurosport with the app does a great job. Uh, I think Amazon's commentary has got a lot better than Eurosports now, but that's maybe a conversation for another day. No, it's interesting because I follow it on ESPN and you get, you know, different filters of different clips from different people depending on where you are searching on tennis Twitter. And yeah, to to your point, you wake up every morning and people are talking about the matches and you're like, what? Like, I didn't see any of it. So that was a little bit frustrating for me. You try and sneak in watching clips wherever you can, no matter what you're doing. Uh, you know, at the time I had a different job. So I was like, hey, you know, this was a couple of weeks ago, but it's still like, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. And they're like, again? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a fourth set breaker I got to catch. Um, but I, for our fans who may not be familiar with your work at Functional Tennis, Fabio, can you give them a little bit of a background, not only, you know, what you guys are up to there, how they can follow you, but also how you got into covering the sport yourself? 
As as I said, a lot of my college friend, a lot of my friends were in college tennis in the state, so they all played tennis. Some Davis Cup, some all toured all different levels. I would have played, but I wasn't as good as those guys. So I went to college here, <laughs> but as they came back, some of them stopped playing tennis. I'd stopped, and we all got back into it. So I just got back into playing tennis, and as I hit my thirties, injuries start creeping up. <laughs> it, the hips start going the glutes you need to strengthen them up so I thought Instagram was a great place had great videos there was great people putting out some uh, good exercises and I, I was like there's nowhere out there that's documenting all of these great exercises so I start putting them on an Instagram account called Functional Tennis think about Functional Tennis Exercises and it sort of just start working and then I start putting up some tennis points and it start getting better and better and just snowballed I don't know how it happened why it happened and my background was in e-commerce, so I was thinking, how can I turn this into an e-commerce business and also follow tennis and, you know, build up a website? So we launched the Functional Tennis Journal, which is for tennis players to do their pre-match and post-match analysis. We launched a practice journal, and yeah, which was been great fun. And then later on, we launched the podcast more recently. We used to actually do a Q and A with all players at the start. We thought, great, we do Q and As, and it got to Burdage said he'd do one, and he looked at it and he goes, "Is this it?" He goes, "You can find out all the answers on the internet. I'm not doing this. Come back to me with something else." So I stopped it that day. I was like, "I'm not doing any more of these. This is terrible." <laughs> I think a year passed, and I thought about the podcast. I was like, "Look, it's time. I'm putting a date on this. I'm launching in like August. I'm doing this, and we just launched, and it's been it's tough work, but it's been going great." Really enjoy it. No, it's funny you mentioned the at Burdish story. I think we've all had a player who sort of some sort of interaction like that it, when you do this uh, tennis media thing. And I'm not going to say who it was, but someone texted me canceling an interview saying, "Sorry, I, I've really been working on my sleep schedule, so I have to go to bed." And it was 7 p.m. And it was like, "Dude, you're not going to bed." Like, come on, let's be honest here. And, like, if you're going to cancel, just freaking have the gumption to cancel on me. Don't give me an excuse like that because that one hurts way worse. But, yeah, I, I mean, you talk about the tennis exercise yourself not being a professional player. I happen to come from a similar background, so that's something that really resonates with me. Uh, for you, it you know, the first thing that stood out was the exercise perspective. And I'm sure in your time you've participated in sports outside of tennis. But can you explain to the listeners why? I, you know, as you mentioned with your friends, they had college tennis backgrounds, so maybe that was part of the influence. But what drew you back to tennis? Why do you think it's a great platform for not just you know young players with professional aspirations, but for adults who just want to get a good exercise in? Why is tennis the medium they should choose? Tennis is a great sport. It's a great way to interact with people. It's competitive, but not too competitive. It's easy enough on the joints. I know I complain of injuries, but a lot of those injuries from other sports, as you mentioned, playing a lot of soccer, a lot of tackles, a bit of rugby, a bit of other things. But uh, yeah, I think as you get older, you have to take care of your body no matter what sport you play. So I just think tennis is a great fun sport that, you know, it's great outdoor sport. I know the weather here isn't great for it, but once the sun comes out, you want to be outside playing outdoors. And it's just a good way to catch up with old friends who, you know, you know, you know going back over 20, 25 years, you would have played tennis with as juniors. You can you know, just go meet up with them. And for me, with functional tennis, it's been unbelievable to meet tennis players all over the world, be it coaches, young fans, older fans, parents, uh, be it you, Alex. Uh, it's just, it's given me an avenue to to just meet people, and not only on the court, but off the court as well. So I think tennis is a great game. It's a sport for life, and I'm really happy I play it. Yeah, we talk about it here, the unintentional comedy factor, the fact that you're out there, it can drive a person insane because it's just you, your errors, your successes, it's all on your shoulders, and so that's for me why a guy like Andy Murray, when he's screaming at his box, I've been there, you play the sport, you're like, oh, I just, you know, you, you're not making the forehand the way you want to on a given day, and it frustrates you, and you just want to scream because you're like, I'm better than this, and so all of those aspects as well as everything you mentioned as well, it's such an accessible sport 
you need two rackets, you need a couple of tennis balls, and you need, uh, to use a pun here, a functional tennis court. Um, and if you have all of those things, you can go out and play with, you know, as many friends as you want. Now, never go and play with three people. I'm telling you, as I think you would agree, a three-person court, oh. you're just like, this sucks. Five people, also the vomit zone, you're like, this is even worse. We have a court of three and a court of two. I just want to be on the court of two the whole time. Um, but I, I would say those are, yeah, little pet peeves for you. Would you agree with those, Fabio? Random tangent. I, w- five is definitely a problem. Five is a big problem. Three, <laughs> three, you can do some doubles trails. You can do some trails. You can play beat the coach is not bad. But five is definitely a problem. I do agree. But look, all of them are better than one. If you show up on your own. <laughs> yeah. Now, there's a wall or, or there's a ball machines, but ideally you want to play with somebody and enjoy it. And yeah, I'm actually taking part in the ITF World Championships in September for the World Over 35 Championships in UMAG, Croatia. And they've actually been on in Florida, Miami the past four years or three years. I haven't been able to play because it's just bad timing. So right now, um, yeah, getting a trainer to help me get a little bit fitter. And I'm going to start concentrating on some better <laughs> tennis soon. So I'm really pumped for it. Like, I still love tennis. And, yeah, it's great. I am so envious right now. I haven't played a competitive match since 2017. And that was – I played not varsity but club tennis in college. And we, we happened – you know, there are club tennis nationals, whatever. It was such a thrill uh, to get to do that. But – the idea, the, the, the reason I don't allow myself to allow myself, this is such a cop out. Uh, the reason I don't play in a USTA league or whatever is I just know I'll get too into it. I'll be like, these guys don't want to put up with me, this 24 year old kid who's making noise and we're just out here trying to get a sweat in and have fun. And I'll be taking it way too seriously. So I am so envious that you are still at the point where you get to compete in an event like that. That's so cool. And for, you know, again, functional tennis, just to give a background, uh, to our listeners who are now interested in it, you guys do highlight the exercises, uh, the way, the, the simple things to make players better, right? And so I'm curious for you, uh, what are you know the little things you've done to maintain your game to this point? Because you know we all have creaky knees eventually, or the shoulder, or the elbow, whatever it is. But what are the fundamental things you would recommend to anyone who's trying to keep their game in check? You know, just it maybe you diminish on the margins, but keep that range of tennis to where I'll use it again. They're still functional tennis players. Now, do you mean your tennis game or your physical shape or physical presence? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. It's just consistency is the key here. I find as, as you get older... Uh, you can maintain a decent level of fitness, but I find once you stop, it just disappears. So consistency is really important. Showing up every day or every two days or three days is important. Going missing for weeks on end is just takes too long to get back to where you were. When you're in your 20s like you, Alex, it's a lot easier to do. You can go missing for a while. You can go drinking. You can do all that sort of stuff, but definitely just showing up every day, doing a little bit, be it a little run, be it some dynamic leg kicks in the morning, just a few press-ups, just doing something every day, be it no matter how small, all helps and all makes you feel better. And then just doing something little will lead you to do something bigger as well, no matter, again, what exercise. Yeah, but, I, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with you. Uh, it's, it's difficult for me. If I take... A week off, I feel it. If I take two weeks, and I'm like afraid because, look, I, I'm playing behind the eight ball to begin with. It's not like I have a whole bank of athleticism in my back pocket. <laughs> um, so I feel like I, I, I love that advice, the idea of it's about the constant effort. It's about doing something each and every day to remain active. Um, you mentioned the physicality in this. I'll use this as a way to segue into our Australian Open. I think you look at the way tennis has developed over the last 20 years and in particular, maybe epitomized by the career of Novak Djokovic, who doesn't hit the biggest forehand, the biggest backhand, but you just can't get a ball by him. The way the game has developed, um, you, you see a dom- you know the way Dominic team even physically, the way he held up with Djokovic over the course of five sets, the way he and Zverev played a very physical four set match. Do you think you know you have to be in better shape as a tennis player in 2020 than you did in the 1990s, in the early 2000s? And how do you think the increasing physicality has changed the game? Uh, 100%. It's just a total game changer. I think Nadal was really the first guy to step it up. I, I know there was players before him where 
was like so Agassi, Ewood came up then and Ewood was fit, could hunt down everything. But Nadal really brought the power, the athleticism, the stamina. He just had the whole package. And I think everybody's had to raise his game because of him. And the level of fitness these guys have are incredible. And it's not something you can build overnight or over a year. It's compound fitness that they have from when they're 12, 13, 14. Every year they're getting fitter and fitter and it's just building, 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 building. And they just rely on that. And that's why their fitness levels are so high. And I think a lot of this started back when they were kids and they've just managed to build. But they've signed and all sorts of Andy Murray wearing his his load monitoring GPS units, just fancy technology they're all using. I know Federer says he doesn't really, he doesn't even do ice baths. But uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, the technology is much better. You just got to be a lot fitter. I know the balls are slower. All the courts are slower. They're also the same pace, really. I know they say some are quicker, but generally the clay courts have got faster. The grass courts got slower. Hard courts are slow. So it's just a tough physical game out there. And then, what temperature was hitting the 40s? I know Celsius in European. What's that in, in the States and Fahrenheit? It's hot. It's in the 90s, 100 range. Like These guys are unbelievable athletes to be able to keep on pounding away. And like Novak Djokovic is an absolute machine. But a lot to be said about Dominic Team with three tough matches. He was still going strong at the end. And was it? When, when what year did Djokovic beat Nadal? Two thousand and eleven or twelve? Where in he beat the, in Aussie 12, Open for the 12. Australian Open. That was twelve. Yeah, he would played the five hour match the day before against Murray, and then he went on, looked fresh as a daisy playing playing Nadal like six hour another five and a half six hours. To me, that was just incredible. Like those, that was just the peak of fitness back then, and it's just grown since then yeah you talk about the court slowing you look at you, know, you watch this tournament all you know all tournament long team did have success but a guy like Roger Federer who although he found himself in the semifinals he got pushed routinely by a tennis Sandgren by a John Millman it just felt like the courts you know Federer couldn't hit through the court and he's 38 years old so that's probably part of the reason why uh, but you're right the, the courts were playing slow fitness became that much more imperative a guy like tennis Sandgren who the three out of five set format just seems to fit so well uh, to him it's his second quarterfinal in the Australian Australian Open. He made a run at the French Open last year. Just the longer the the match goes, and you can tell he's shirtless. His biceps are glaring through. Obviously, uh, these the the fitter the player, the the longer you can last in those matches. Look at the fact that John Millman did look as good as he did, raced out to that eight four lead in the fifth set breaker against Federer. Fitness is half the battle in these Grand Slam tournaments. Anyone can play one five-set match, but how many times do you see a guy play a five-set match then run out of steam? You look at a guy like Fabio Fognini, who was tested in his first matches. You know, he goes five sets with Opelka in the first round, goes five sets again later on in the tournament uh, when he plays. I think it was the next round against Jordan Thompson when he mm. uh, won that match 10-4, beats Pea in straight sets, but then Sandgren just able to wear him down. Fitness is everything at this point. And I do think, again, for these three out of five cent matches that we see at the Australian Open, it's Sandgren. Last year it was Tiafo and Luca Pui and Hyun Chung the year before that. If you come into the year physically fit, Australia is the place that rewards that, I think, above all others. Yeah, no, definitely. And the guys who get a good preseason in, just a shout out to Tenny Sangren's biceps. He was working his biceps hard uh, <laughs> during the preseason. And a friend of mine, the guys who own the brand Latour Tennis, they do some crazy shirts. He wears he wears their clothes and they were delighted when he decided he was going to wear the sleeveless top to show off his guns. But no, he was impressive. <laughs> and that, that match against Fognini was some good high level tennis. And... Yeah, Fognini just ran out of steam, but Tenny pushed them all the way. But I do think Fognini makes life difficult for himself. He is one yeah, of the fitter. He's, absolutely. He is one of the fitter guys. He's extremely fit, but he makes life difficult for himself. So it's own fault. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I do think, though, 
you know, repeatedly over the course of this tournament, it was that for Nadal against team, I, now I, I don't think, I don't know if it was physical wear out, but you could tell that match against Kyrgios definitely took a lot out of him. For Kyrgios against Nadal, you go five sets with Hatchinov, win that breaker 10-8 in the fifth, that takes so much out of you as a player, not just physically, but emotionally as well. And there's something to being said that, you know, being physically fit, having the confidence to know you can play back-to-back five set matches helps, uh, your mentality as well, but I, I do think that is one of the larger narratives from this Australian Open is how imperative in the 2020s moving forward, you know, and we saw it again through the last decade of tennis as well, physical fitness will be uh, to these guys who want to make deep runs as long as it's a best of five set format. We don't have to get into best of three versus best of five today. I do want to talk a little bit on the women's side as well, because for on the women's side, it was, you know, it, it seems like now more than ever, we keep waiting for a breakthrough, a rush of players on the men's side to eclipse the big three, big four, to win a bunch of slams. Uh, we're, we're no longer in that phase on the women's side. I don't remember who tweeted the stat, but 11 of the past 13 slam winners have been different players on the WTA side here in Australia. We see Sophia Kennan win her first slam. She knocks off Garbine Muguruza, who has won two slams, but I think at one point last year had like a nine-match losing streak. Um, the, I think the floodgates are open on the WTA side, and last year we saw four different champions. One of my predictions coming into this year is I think we're going to see four different champions again. Would you agree or disagree with that? I can't disagree. Okay, I, I'll take that. I can't disagree. You just don't know what's going to happen. They're so open. Anybody can win. Look, we're still hoping that Serena can pull off another title at some stage, Like, but... The women, anybody can win, and it's it's really tough. Like they think they're in control, and then somebody like is it so is it Sonia or Sophia? So her name's Sophia. She goes by Sonia Cannon. Okay, because I wasn't sure. I remember last year there was a lot of discussion about it, and then she changed her Instagram mm-hmm. handle. I was like, which one is she <laughs> now? But uh, yeah, like it's, it's just been amazing. A lot of the talk was on Bianca. She pulled out, and then yeah, she steps in, does a great job. It's just and then. Uh, Gabrine comes back like nobody expected that so just surprises everywhere which is it's amazing to see like it makes it really exciting and it's great like only I'm just going to take it back to the men's here a sec and it's the way like Fedra, Djokovic and Dal are like protectors of the ream like in the Game of Thrones we're like they're working together like the longer they stay playing together the more Grand Slams are going to win. If Federer drops off, it's just going to let somebody else in there and ruin everything. So those guys, <laughs> if, if those guys keep playing, they'll keep cleaning up the Grand Slams until one retires. And then all of a sudden, you don't have to beat two of them to win a Grand Slam. I think, is it is Stan the only guy to beat two, to beat two of them to win a Grand Slam? I think so. I think, no, Del Potro, I think, did it as oh, well. Did, was right? it? I'm not sure. In 09? Okay. He I thought he beat Federer. Beat Federer. He beat Nadal, then Federer. Okay, okay. I'll so, look this up as you're going, but carry on. So, yeah, so like those three guys are just protected the realm, and it's hard to get through. It's just impossible. They just make life so difficult. And same with them. Normally, one of them can't beat, you know, they can't win two. It normally comes from the other side to draw. So, Federer, Nadal, on one side, Djokovic comes through a bit easier run. But, yeah, the guys are amazing. And the females is just a bit more open. There's nobody there willing to take control. I, I, I'm fist pumping on the video. Uh, I've distracted you, Fabio, because Del Potro straight set win 2-2-2 two, two, and two over Nadal before he beat Federer for that Grand Slam okay. title. Great memory. Um, yes. Yeah, you know, hey, great shot is what we say on one of our podcasts. But yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. One of the questions I'm going to be writing about for one of uh, our pieces on Crack Rackets coming up is for Novak Djokovic, at 17 slams, he's what, 32 years old? Yeah, I think 32, maybe a little yeah. Bit, 32 years old entering the season. The idea of him getting 20, 21 seems not only feasible, it seems almost likely at this point so is the race now for Novak Djokovic that 20 mark or is it that 23 and the real question is can he pass Serena at some point that's again an article an idea I'm going to be exploring but it's interesting isn't it I think it's possible the form he's in now I know he was in better form last January 
at the way he dismantled Nadal in the final. I know. I think this year he was there for the taken. Had Federer been in better form, I think he, Federer could have done a bit more damage there. And I think Team definitely had his chances. I'm not sure what went on in the fourth. He did, he just didn't pound enough. He Team wasn't playing well. Let's be honest. He didn't. He hardly made one backhand end the line, and he needed that shot to be on fire to win. So he did a good job with that not firing. So I think Djokovic was there for the taking, but it just shows Djokovic is the guy who gets knocked out, knocked out. He's really the Rocky Balboa tennis. <laughs> for you to go Game of Thrones and Rocky Balboa in the same podcast, that is just the ideal podcast partner. I'm thrilled to hear that. Yeah, I don't think it's that team played poorly. I think it's more that you know Djokovic just wore him down you talk about that backhand down the line being so important I thought it was evident that Djokovic uh, really made a conscious choice on the deuce side to hit the slice serve out wide and open up team to just as much space as possible force team to hit that backhand on the run you know the thing I'm going to miss most about the Australian Open probably their website because they do such a good job with the statistics you look at the Infosys stats for this match between Djokovic and team Uh, again Djokovic really doing a a good job of targeting the team backhand on the rally. One of the stats they have, winners and forced errors versus unforced errors for each of the players on each of those wings. In this match, team five winners, five forced errors, but 25 unforced errors on that backhand side. He's minus 15. And for Djokovic, look, he was minus six on the backhand, but he did enough. He wore team down in a match that was decided in five sets on the margins. That was a good enough job. I agree with you and so to your point even if he's not playing as well as he was a couple of years ago a someone still got to beat him on a hard court I know he lost last year at the U.S. Open health issue you know there were health concerns in that and moving forward Djokovic has never been a guy who's always had a clean bill of health he has Mm. struggled with many nagging injuries throughout his career but until one of the young guys wins one, it's just not. It's not going to feel feasible. It just. It's not. It's like it's Djokovic to win on a hard court or even at Wimbledon until one of the other guys beats him. And Federer's getting older. You know, Rafa. It's the French is his to lose until he loses it. But but if you're Novak Djokovic, what if I told you he wins Wimbledon and the U.S. Open this year? What would shock you more if Djokovic wins three slams or if someone on the women's side wins more than one slam this season? Probably the women's. I agree. Probably. Like Because you see the recipe for Djokovic, right? We've all seen it so many times, and we don't know what a team upset at the French Open over Rafa looks like. We don't know whether it's, you know, maybe Opelka just serves out of his mind for two weeks or Kevin Anderson's really healthy or, you know, one of those, Milos Raonic just serve bots his way to a Wimbledon title. But we do know what Djokovic looks like on a hard court, and we haven't really seen anyone beat him healthy on that surface over these past three, uh, two or three years. No, I completely agree with you. He's still young. He's only 32. He's in his prime right now. Eh, he, I'm, I, I have eight years, but is, is 32 young? 30, no, I'm just 32. I'm, I'm just gonna, you're making me feel really <laughs> old now. But no, I think he is in his prime where he has the stamina, the strength. He knows more intelligent. He's uh, mentally, he's mentally strong. He's, he's like a fort up there. I know he talks, he's talked a lot about how he grew up in Serbia, the food money issues, and that made him so tough. And I think it has made him so tough, but he's the guy I never say die. And, yeah, he sort of sucks in in a way. You think you have it, and then he just comes right back and takes it all away from you. Yeah, it's so fun to watch, and I know it's again one. Of, it's another storyline to throw into his chase for the record book. Uh, he's already done so many great things, and it's something we will watch. But now that the Australian Open's done, people think, okay, well, is there really any tennis until the French Open? And the answer is yes. There's tons of it. We have the Sunshine Double coming up in a co- in about a month uh, in my, the Indian Wells Miami uh, Master and Premier Mandatory event swings. Uh, we've got Challenger events galore. Dallas this week right now tons of Americans in action there all of which we'll be covering on our mini break podcast and of course on the college tennis front we've got the ITA National Indoors upcoming this weekend and my question to you Fabio is going to be moving forward post Australian Open what do you have your eyes on? What do I have my eyes on? I was just thinking the Miami the us the Key Biscayne in Miami does that really count anymore like Federer if he wins that does that really mean anything that's not going to change your CV <laughs> at all 
So that's why these guys' seasons is just it's about grand slams, nothing else. Like I think Djokovic would sooner let Federer give him a win at my I'll give him a win at Miami, but I'm taking Wimbledon. I think there's a bit so of my, that. My, so my counterpoint is for Roger Federer. You're correct. Other than maybe the Olympics, which I know he wants to be healthy to play, it's the only blemish yeah. he has on his resume. By the way. Let's no. Let's not have people forget Novak Djokovic this season. Uh, he wants an Olympic gold medal for his resume too. He doesn't have one. My boy, two-time defending gold medalist Andy Murray, the holder of the last two Djokovic losing in Argentina or in Brazil, excuse me, first round to the Argentinian Juan Martín del Potro. And for those who don't remember, he left the court in tears. He was devastated by that moment. So I think we have that bonus event as well. But it's not fair to say that only the slams matter because for anyone not named Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, uh, everything else does matter. We still want to see these next-gen guys first beat these big three. I call it a big four, but the big three right now uh, at the Masters events, get the confidence so that they can do it, and then beat them at a slam. We've seen Dominic Team. He wins Indian Wells last year. Now he makes the final of the Australian Open. Daniil Medvedev, finals of the City Open, finals of the Rogers Cup, wins City, uh, Cincinnati, leverages that confidence into a final of the U.S. Open. So I think everything does matter. Now, again, not for Roger Federer. But, true, true. You know, for us, you know, if, if no one's tuning in between now and the French <laughs> Open, we're 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 sh- out of luck. Yeah, no, no, no. You're you're true. Uh, you know, you sp- you speak the truth there. I was just more thinking of the big guys. That's all they're interested in right now at the stage of their career. But there's yeah, there's plenty coming up uh, soon. Probably quite f- quite a few weeks for me. I know there's a lot of challengers going on. Uh, there's college tennis. I wouldn't be, as I was speaking to you before, this the biggest college tennis guy in the world. But I've got into it lately. We've had some college guests on our on our show. We've had the Brett Macy, great coach over there at USC. We had Dominic Kofler, who is what's he pro about three years now. He's mm-hmm. doing an From amazing. Tulane. Yeah, he's doing an amazing job. And a friend of mine actually was his assistant coach at Tulane, who was previously a player at Tulane crazy and then uh, yeah who, who we ha- peter smith i hope to get on at some stage the great peter smith and then dave mullins another friend of mine from ireland who's now working for the ita so yeah just i'm getting more into college tennis it's it's re- it's really good it's really good and i'm looking forward to seeing mr wolf's quads at some tournament this year <laughs> <laughs> oh no that's uh uh, as a first of all, I, my fandom of Irish tennis continues to grow more and more and more between yourself, between Dave, who we've been had on. Um, yeah, clearly you guys are doing something right there. Um, so you know, share the secrets. Uh, don't be afraid. Yeah, it's a really fun time to be a tennis fan. It's the start of a new season. You know, we forgot about Shapovalov and FAA, but you know, two weeks before the Australian Open, ATP Cup and Shapovalov's performance was all we could talk about. So let's you know not forget how many young guys there are who this February you know stretch through the hard courts. And then in the beginning of the clay season is the meat and potatoes of their year. So a lot of fun things for us to monitor. Uh, for our listeners again. Uh, before we wrap up here, uh, where can they find your stuff, Fabio? What, what, where should they be following you to learn what you guys at Functional Tennis will be up to? Well, yeah, Functional Tennis on Instagram, simple as that. Just put us in the search bar or you can go to our website, functionaltennis.com. We have some free downloads for match planning, for practice planning. Or you can check out our podcast, just search for Functional Tennis. Uh, we have a weekly podcast there. So we're on a few different platforms. We're not so active on Twitter now. It's just one man struggles to do everything so we try and do a few (laughs) we try and do a few things right rather than a lot of things half so yeah we're out there we're loving the tennis looking forward to a big year and looking forward to some more cracked shows (laughs) and you said you weren't going to swear by the way i know it came out in an accent but that still counts um what did i say no you said and i will say you said (laughs) and oh sorry (laughs) Technically, I get to quack that. Um, I mean, no, you please don't apologize. It was the most beautiful form of swearing this Cracked Interviews podcast has ever seen. Um, but no, uh, uh, I, I, I want... 
Yeah, I want to echo your uh, sentiment as well. Uh, I do think that, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting time. Of course, you don't want to do t- too many things. But again, yeah, what you guys are doing at Functional Tennis is so benefic- beneficial to the tennis community. So we really appreciate that. And yeah, we would always continue to love to have you on. A couple bonus questions before we wrap up. Uh, just because, again, for our listeners who want to learn a little bit more about you, what you guys are up to, uh, you talk about your guests. So I I don't want you, you don't have to throw any interviews under the bus people you don't like but if you were to give our listeners one interview you think they should listen to of yours which would you pick our, our most popular one is not about any tennis players it's about tennis stringers they talk about rackets racket customization what companies do with the rackets painting rackets really interesting episode if you're into that and how you can gain an advantage from customizing your racket uh, I checked that one out. I did the Dominic Kofler one. It was really exciting. And today, if they want to hear about an Irishman, we had an Irishman launched today, uh, Joe Dwyer. He tells some good stories. He's been around the tour a long time. There's mentions of all sorts of pro players. Don't know how true most of the stories are now, but uh, <laughs> they're really good. He talks really great. And yeah, check. It. We've had some great episodes and I've been really happy with them, but the string one's good, the Kofler one's good, and today's one's great. And yeah, actually, another friend of mine, Dave O'Hare, is going over to take the assistant job at Memphis. Ooh, Joe he, Salisbury University. He was Joe Sa- Salisbury's partner in college. They got to number three in the States, and they went, they were touring for a while together, and then they just, Dave, one got injured, so they went their separate ways, but they're still mates, and Dave worked with him. Oh, well, he was at the ATP Tour Finals working with him last year. So I sent Dave a message. It's like, you quit a month too early. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. That is great to hear. Well, then, a couple others, and we'll let you go. Uh, you talk about your own tennis game. If you were to compare your style to any current player, who would you pick? Well, it's not Roger. We all Fe- have that guy. It's not Roger. <laughs> it's it's not. not Roger Federer. It's not Roger Federer. <laughs> I'm not the uh, multi-talent. It's all hard work I've got to where I am on my tennis game. But no, a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of an old school Agassi. I go back. <laughs> Agassi is my childhood hero. Childhood hero. I, I still try and be an inner Andre Agassi. Uh, so just once I want to hear someone be like, you know, I'm more of a Marius Kopel. Like I am just really like the, you know, the Mitchell Kruger of the tennis it, world instead of like, no, I'm a poor man's fed. It's always one of those we, top comparisons. I would say I'm the poorest, poorest, poorest man living on the streets, Mitchell Kruger. Mitchell Kruger. I'm trying to and picture that. a challenge that. I'm special I'm, for you. I'm trying to picture that. I know the, I know the guy, but yeah. Okay. Well, we have to, we'll have yeah. to face off in a tennis in, court someday. Yeah. You, know, you would say, wow, I never want to hit a forehand like he does, but that's actually pretty good. You'd be happy with it. You, you take it. Yeah, yeah. We well, did, maybe not the forehand. The backhand, you'll be happy with. We, I take Marius Copel's backhand. Pretty sweet backhand. We had him on I the would podcast. Take his everything. Yeah, <laughs> we had him on the sh- <laughs> we we had him on the show episode number three. Really nice guy, and I've met him at some tournaments, and he's one of the nicest guys out there. Made a lot of time for us, so really appreciate that. No, oh, and I appreciate you sneaking in the last plug because Marius Kopel's an interview I know our listeners will enjoy hearing, and even if it's an old one, uh, it's, I'm sure, still special. So, uh, Fabio, again, thank you so much for taking the time. It's at Functional Tennis on Instagram. Uh, hopefully we get the chance to talk to you soon. Definitely, definitely. I'll, I'll have you on our show. We'll get your side of the story on our show very soon, Alex. Uh, you're not going to want to hear that. Um, <laughs> but no, it sounds good, Fabio. Take care, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.